Star Wars The Last Jedi, where to begin? Generally speaking, I don't have too many major complaints with this movie. It's a Star Wars film. It looks, acts, and sounds like a Star Wars film probably should do. It's a reasonably solid installment into the franchise. However, I have my gripes, and this could have been a much better movie. Picking up immediately after the conclusion of The Force Awakens, Rey confronts Luke Skywalker on the planet Actu, while Poe Dameron leads a dangerous counterattack against the First Order fleet. Kylo Ren senses the presence of his mother Leia on the lead resistance ship and chooses not to open fire. However, TIE fighters destroy the bridge. She's sucked out into space in a scene where I truly struggle to suspend my disbelief. She somehow uses the force to, you know, survive the vacuum of space and returns to the ship, though she's comatose for most of the film thereafter. The First Order have figured out a way to track the Resistance fleet when they go to light speed using a tracking device. With Leia out of action, the rather inept Vice Admiral Amelin Holdo is left in charge. Poe, BB-8, Finn, and a new character, Rose Tico, come up with a secret plan to disable the tracking device and later even commit mutiny in the process. This requires them to visit a planet called Cantobite, a kind of planet-sized Monte Carlo built upon corruption and home to the super wealthy of the galaxy. They go there to try to find a hacker who can disable the tracking device. The sequence really serves as an arbitrary set piece and visual departure for the movie, in keeping with the tradition of having a typical Star Wars alien bar nightclub location filled with weird-looking aliens. It's fine, but it's clear that this was put into the movie to extend the runtime and stretch out the rather shallow subplot for much of the duration of the film. While this is happening, Luke refuses to train Rey in the ways of the Force. She receives numerous Force visions connecting her across the galaxy with Kylo Ren. They converse across great distances. She learns that Luke had failed Kylo in Jedi training and considered killing him because he knew the darkness that Supreme Leader Snoke had awoken within him. Long story short, though Luke does help Rey somewhat, she ultimately leaves the planet without him. Luke must be convinced to join the fight against the First Order by the Force Ghost, Master Yoda. Rey is soon captured by Kylo Ren and brought before Snoke, but Kylo, aka Ben Solo, ultimately betrays Snoke, kills him, and tries to convince Rey to join him and rule the galaxy together. Meanwhile, the Resistance craft are making their way to the abandoned rebel base, Crate, but they're being picked off by the First Order one by one, and their numbers are dwindling rapidly. Leah is back in charge, having put down down Poe's insurrection, and BB-8 Finn and Rose's plan to sabotage the tracking device ultimately fails. However, Vice Admiral Holdo sacrifices herself by ramming Snoke's ship at light speed and provides the Resistance enough time to arrive at the planet Crate, where they mount one last stand against the First Order. With everyone now on the planet and the Millennium Falcon successfully drawing most of the TIE fighters away, Luke arrives just in time to buy the retreating Resistance enough time to escape. Again. Kylo is unable to defeat Luke using the vast First Order arsenal and can't so much as land a single blow against him using a lightsaber. Turns out Luke isn't really there. He's projecting himself from Actu. Rey uses her Force powers to help the Resistance escape in the Millennium Falcon. Their numbers reduce to just a few now. Then Luke dies for no real reason and becomes one with the Force in a very disappointing outcome that seems to undermine the whole point of projecting himself onto Crate in the first place. I guess he'd made peace with his failure to train Kylo and received whatever closure he needed. On Canto Bite, one of the kids we saw earlier uses his Force powers to pick up a broom and looks up into the sky with hope, as if to suggest that the future of the Resistance will continue with this new generation. It's not a bad conclusion, but the film suffers very much from the issues that The Empire Strikes Back did. It's the awkward middle child of the trilogy. You know that the film is really just serving to bridge the first and third films together. There is some really clever humor along the way, and much better character moments in this movie. Even Rey seems much more multidimensional as a heroine. Though I will admit that some of the jokes do seem a little bit out of place, and just make the First Order, particularly General Hux, seem incompetent and buffoonish. With the exception of Kylo Ren, the First Order make for an unthreatening and clownish group, that I never really took seriously as imposing villains. They have all these immensely powerful Star Destroyers at their disposal, but they're easily overcome so long as the Resistance use the maneuverability of their small craft to attack them at close range. This is a barely believable component of the movie, designed to somewhat neuter the villains out of pure necessity for the story. The biggest problem with the movie is the subplot, which is the First Order chasing the Resistance fleet using the tracking device at light speed. Each time the Resistance jumps to light speed, 
They can be found by the First Order, and gradually the Resistance will run out of fuel. This is the plan of General Hux. In an outright battle, the First Order possesses all of the firepower necessary to wipe out the Resistance. But the Riders had to contrive this stalemate situation just to stretch out the subplot long enough in order to allow the primary plot with Luke and Rey on the planet to fully unfold. This means, of course, that there's some rather boring and slow elements to the movie, a lot like the first hour of The Empire Strikes Back. It's also the reason that the Canto Bite sequence had to be squeezed into the film. Given these issues, perhaps it's just as well there's some decent levity and humour throughout, so that the film doesn't take itself too seriously. As I expected, The Last Jedi picks up immensely in the last 20 to 30 minutes, and that really saves the film for me. Generally speaking, The Last Jedi is an enjoyable enough movie, but it's a fairly stock addition to the legacy. If you're content with knowing that in advance, however, I think you'll be reasonably entertained.